typical fashion, um, whenever I, I try to uh, make a single, um, I don't know what you call it, just acknowledgement, I mess up. Dr. Guthrie was not the elder statesman of the room. Norm Gould is actually the, uh, the elder statesman of the room. So you get a coffee mug, sir. Um, amen. There you go. Appreciate you. <laughs> yes. Better known as Papa. Um, yes. And I, every time I see you here with us on Sunday mornings, I am so thankful for it. Uh, talk about a pillar of stability. That's him. Um, means so much to so many people. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pray, but I do want to just say, you know, welcome to those of you that are, that are here. Maybe uh, you, your guests, uh, maybe you are searching. And I say this often, but this is a great place to land. It's a great place to be. And, and I would love to get to know you. If you want to chat a while um, at the end of service when we're walking out, feel free to do that. Um, if you don't, keep your head down and keep walking. Uh, that's fine, too, because if we make eye contact, we're going to talk. So just hold your head down and keep walking. That's the cue. Uh, so let me pray. We'll be in Psalm 67 together this morning. Gracious God, thank you for the gathering this morning. God, the gathering of the local church, the gathering of the saints. God, the gathering of the grateful. Father, would you communicate to us this morning through your word? Father, thank you for the chance to exposit it, to dig into it, to press into it, Lord. God, communicate today as only you can. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. There is a special guest in the room as well. Um, this is his first time attending. Uh, baby Benjamin is with us as well. It's his first time here, and we're grateful to see him and see that you're doing well, Rachel and Dusty. Um, so let's look at Psalm 67. Now, with these psalms, you often see a, a title at the beginning, at the top of those psalms, a, a subscription, and it gives us a little bit of detail into what's about to happen. Sometimes there's good description or great description uh, that's very detailed. Sometimes we're left with not a whole lot. And so when you look at the scripture for this in Psalm 67, it says, To the choir master with string instruments, a psalm, a song. So a question that you should logically ask is, who is the choir master then? Every time I hear that word choir master, I think of some like old lady with a ruler, and she's going to slap your hand every time you sing off key. Um, but I don't think that's the old lady with a ruler in the text. Um, so we don't know who the choir master was. We're not sure, but it will be appropriate to ascribe that the choir master, the chief musician, is God himself. God himself is the chief musician. He is the chief choir master. Who better to write and lead a song about himself than God himself? And so when you approach this text, you should think of God leading the way. Now, as I was studying this passage this week, as I was reading commentary about it, uh, there is something that one commentator said, and it just like leaf, leaped off the pages and just literally like screwed the light bulb in over my head. This commentator said, when approaching the Psalms, it is always necessary to start by asking the question, what is God after? I would encourage you to write that down. What is God after? See, asking the right question will lead to the right answer. The wrong question to ask in this text and any text is, what am I after? Because that self-centered question, it always will lead to a self-centered answer. And the best you can emerge from that question is with more behavior modification. You look at a text, you look at a passage, you look at the Psalms and go, hey, how can I be a better person? So I'm going to go to the Psalms and try to find some motivation, but the best you can do is just kind of alter your modifi and modify your behavior. But answering the question of what is God after will always lead to heart transformation. Always. So let's determine off the bat what God is after in Psalm 67. 
Psalm 67 verse 1 says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Selah. Verse 2, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all the nations. From there, over the next five verses, we build around that thesis statement within verse 2. We build around what God is after, which is verse 2, that your way may be known on earth and your saving power among all the nations. Now let's walk through this text with that in mind. Psalm 67, verse 1, there is a request for blessing. There's a request that is being made. And here it is. May God be gracious or merciful. The the better translation for that word is actually merciful. So when you hear gracious, think merciful. May God be merciful to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Now, these words actually come from a blessing that is pronounced over in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. It was Aaron who was the high priest of the nation. And Aaron declares this blessing over God's people. And this is what he says in Numbers 6.24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. But in Psalm 67 verse 1, the psalmist, he doesn't start like Aaron did in Numbers chapter 6. Aaron started by asking for a blessing. But whenever we see this particular text in Psalm 67, he starts by asking for mercy. This sets our hearts in the right frame of mind. When we start and approach God asking for mercy, because we are sinners who are in need of the mercy of God. Spurgeon said, the best saints and the worst sinners may unite in this petition. Why do we unite in the petition of asking God for mercy? Because we don't bring anything to the table but sin. So if I'm approaching a holy God, I have to come to him and first ask for mercy. See, it's never appropriate for us to demand from from God something without acknowledging our state of dependency. If you're a parent this morning, you know how this feels. When your toddler comes to you and they demand another juice box from you, demand it. When they demand, I need more time on my tablet with Bluey, they demand it. They demand an extended bedtime. And I'm like, hold on a second. You can't even wipe your tail. (laughs) And you're demanding something of me to give to you? God is like, look, I love you and I created you, but figuratively speaking, you can't even wipe your own tail. You're going around and making a mess on everything. And when we approach God, it should be, Lord, have mercy upon me because you see what I've done. You see the mess that I have made. Did you know that God could show mercy toward us by simply leaving us alone and not destroying us? God could simply say, the extension of mercy that I'm showing upon you is that I let you live. God could do that. God could say, all right, I will let you continue to breathe my air. That's it. But with the psalmist, he goes a bit further. And the psalmist, he knew that, listen, if if this is as far as this holy God is willing to go, if existence is the only thing that we can ask God for, then I better just stop with mercy. I better just say, God, would you be merciful towards me? Would you let me continue to exist and to live and breathe? And I'm just going to stop right there. But obviously the psalmist has some type of preliminary, pre-existing reassurance of confidence to not only ask God for mercy, but he goes a leap further and he asks God for a blessing. He said, God, be merciful to me, but I'm actually going to ask you for a little bit more. Would you also bless me? Interesting. Do you know how bold this is? Especially after knowing that 
that we have this diaper full of sin. Imagine that if you were a guilty criminal, let's just say you did something that was egregiously wrong, and you knew that you did it, you were guilty of it, and you stand before a judge and you plead for mercy. Say, judge, would you please be merciful to me? Like, I know I did that thing, but if you would just let me off, please, just let me get by with this. Like, don't condemn me in a just way that you certainly can, but if you would just let me off the hook, just give me mercy, show me grace, let me go. And imagine that the judge hears your case and the judge says to you, you know what? I'm going to let you go. I'm going to show mercy upon you. Even though you are rightly guilty of this crime, I'm going to exonerate you from that crime. Can you imagine that you then say to the judge, you know what, judge, thank you so much. Thank you for releasing me of my just sentence. But I have one more thing to ask. When they take these handcuffs off of me and I go outside, can there be a brand new F-150 waiting on me? Can you also make sure that there's a brand new boat attached to it as well? Oh, and by the way, make sure that my bank account is totally full from here on. Judge, would you also do that for me? Can you imagine what that judge would say? The judge would say, you know what? I'm going to reconsider what I gave you. Lock them up and put them in jail. (laughs) Right? That would be absolutely insane for us to, to approach a judge and and make those additional requests after we beg to be let off the hook and the judge grants us that mercy. But when we ask God for mercy, there is more that the forgiven actually asks for behind that. But it's not for a blessing wrapped up in stuff. It's a blessing of a state and a posture of a surety in him. So let's dig into that. He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us. Then he says, and make his face shine upon us. To have the glorious, happy face of God shining on us is the greatest gift that we could ever have. To to, to know that God looks upon you and he is pleased with what he sees. And it's not because of us, but because of God in us. It's not because of who we are, what we've done, but because of Christ, there is no greater source of peace than to be reassured of that. That God's face, it shines upon us when it looks at us. And you might ask, well, what is so significant about God's face shining upon us? Well, in the Middle Eastern context, if an individual wanted to go before a monarch or go before a king and request something, that ruler would actually reveal within their facial expression, their pleasure or displeasure with that party. They didn't have to say anything. Their face would say it all. My wife and my daughter are really good at that, by the way. And so we see this idea of the importance of the face, the countenance. And the psalmist says, Lord, I want your countenance to shine upon me. Give me a reassurance of your you being pleased with me. And then we see Selah. I'm, I've said this before, but I want to emphasize it this morning. It's, it's the idea in this Hebrew word. It, it recurs 74 times in the Old Testament. And it's a pause. It's meant to be a break of reflection, uh, a time of meditation upon what was just spoken. So in this text, like when it says Selah, I, w- I want to give you a few things. Like stop and pause and think of God's mercy in your life. Stop and pause and think of God's blessing and his countenance shining upon you. Stop and pause and be grateful for God's approval of you through Christ. In verse 2, there is a reason for the blessing. It says that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all the nations. Again, that is what God is after within Psalm 67. That his way may be known. And the saving power among all the nations. Now, the reason the psalmist asked for this blessing, it was not rooted in selfish ambition. It wasn't rooted in a selfish reason. God, I need you to bless me with some stuff. I need this. I need that. There's a motive for the asking of the blessing. He asked for the blessing for the sake of God's glory. And particularly for that glory to be dispersed on behalf of the nations that were perishing. Let me ask you a question this morning. 
Are the nations still perishing today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Then what should the cry of the church be? It should be, Lord, be gracious to us. Let the proof of your favor be upon us so that the truth of your way through your word may be seen and a dying world can know that there is only one God that can save. That is to be the cry of the church, but instead so many churches, they don't ask for mercy as we see in the beginning of Psalm because they think that their diaper isn't full of mess. They want the blessing, but it's not to declare to the nations that God is God and he's a God of salvation and and it can only be found in him. They want the blessings so that they can say, hey, look at the kingdom that I built. Come to us for better morality. Come to us for more self-help. Come to us for more motivational speeches. But I'm here to tell you this morning that in the midst of a world that placates to the culture, in the midst of churches, that bow their knee. There is one little bitty church down at the end of a dead end street. And that church is Life Church of Athens. And we want to make it extremely clear that there is one name under heaven by which people may be saved. There is one God deserving of all praise whose way will be declared and made known on the earth. And his saving power will be declared among the nations. So how do we make God's way known on earth? When people see the work of God in the lives of his people, this is how it's done. When they see the work of God active in your life, the way of God is being made known. His blessings active upon you. It's one way that we make God's way known. But we make it very clear when the watching world turns to us and asks for an explanation. We make it very clear that you don't get the content without going to the source. And the source is in the word of God. The source is taught and proclaimed within the local church and ministry extensions of the local church. But we will find ourselves being a walking contradiction if we declare allegiance to God, but our life declares that we have no king but Caesar. James Boyce, he said, It may be said without fear, of contradiction that the greatest hindrance to evangelism in the world today is the failure of the church to supply evidence in her own life and the work of the saving power of God. That we fail to supply evidence in our own life. The motive for the blessing is to live a life that makes the way of the Lord known and brings hope of salvation to the nations. Now the nations, by the way, can be represented at Starbucks. The nations can be represented at Publix. The nations can be represented at the restaurant you're going to be eating at in 30 minutes. The nations is represented all around you. And so when you hear that word, when you hear that in verse 2, you live that out everywhere that you are because the nations are represented everywhere that you are. Now, you remember my story about the judge showing mercy and how that individual would look ridiculous and asking for more on top of the mercy that was already extended. But what if we change the story a little bit? What if you had asked for the mercy, the mercy was granted to you, and you turned to walk away very grateful? But you stop and you pause and you turn around and you say, Judge, may I, may I ask you one more question? Judge, I've, I've been a recipient of the mercy that you've shown to me in this moment. And whenever I leave out of here, there's nothing waiting on me. I have no plans. I have no ambition. There's no life out here for me. But I've been stirred by what you've done for me. And Judge, I'm just asking and wondering, what would it look like if maybe you helped provide a scholarship for me to maybe even go to law school? Because I've been able to see the mercy that you extended to me, and I would love to maybe become an attorney so that I can share and extend this mercy to others just to be able to tell this testimony of what happened here today and what you did for me. You think that might get the judge's attention a little bit? 
chances might have just got better for some blessing to be added. Why? Because the purpose of the blessing in that case is to turn praise back to the one who did the blessing. And in essence, that's what the blessing of the Lord is. It's not God bless me so that I can get access to more stuff. It's God bless me so that my voice can go further and louder to sing of who you are and what you've done for me. That is the blessing. There is a reason to praise God in verse 3 through 5. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the people with equity. You guide the nations upon the earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. So we see this reason for, for praise that is coming forward. God has allowed himself to be known, his way to be known on the earth. God has allowed us to speak on behalf of the nations and say, God, please extend mercy to the nations, not just so that they can be spared from your wrath, but so that they can actually know you. They can actually know there is salvation in the one true God. The first thing that we notice here in, in verse 3, it says, let the peoples praise you, O God. We notice that the first and foremost thing is that it is a prayer to God. It's fine to call upon the peoples to praise God. But it's also necessary to ask God to bring the nations to himself. We pray, God, I, I ask that you would save Susie, but, but not just so that she can come to life church or that she can be saved. Save her unto yourself. Draw her to you. Let her come to know you. Desire a relationship with you. We're not evangelizing people to bring them into this building. We're evangelizing people to bring them to Christ. When they come to Jesus, they realize, oh, wait, I need to be here, too. I need to be under the teaching of the word. He says, Lord, bring the nations to you. Now, why do we want people to go to God and, 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 and praise God? Because we want them to know who they're praising. And we want them to know what they're praising him for. This is why worship through singing and worship through teaching and preaching should always go hand in hand. Always. I speak at a number of, of camps, youth camps throughout the summer. I got one to speak at in two weeks. It'll be 600 students there. And oftentimes I go to these camps and it's the mountaintop experience. Uh, you can go to conferences, all types of things. And I look at the program and oftentimes without fail, you got your announcements, you got your hype stuff, all this stuff. There's an hour and a half for worship. There's 20 minutes for preaching. And my dilemma is that, listen, I want y'all to sing, but I sure do want you to know who you're singing about. I want you to know why you have a reason to sing. And it's no wonder that we deal with kids over and over and, and, and students over and over and even adults that want to go to these things over and over and you sing for an hour and a half and then you leave the building and go fornicate. Yeah, let's sing all day. But at least let me have my singing be grounded. See, biblically grounded singing puts you in a place that you've never been before. Most of the time when I'm in that place it's actually really hard for me to even say anything. I have to just listen. Sometimes you just cry. Sometimes you just fall to your knees. When is the last time that you were at that place of worship, if ever? That's why scripture describes those who are in heavenly places in the presence, the manifest presence of God. It's often describing them as being prostrate as being bowed down laid bare before the Lord it's not that they voluntarily chose that position it is because that's where glory put them glory drove them to their face and I look forward to the day when all the nations come together and worship of our liberating king a great snapshot of that is in Revelation 7 9 it says after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne to the lamb 
And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's the snapshot of our eternity, is worship of God forever, but informed by who he is in his word. Finally, we see the result of, of praising God in verse 6 and 7. It says, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Now, when you see this, this first line here in verse 6, it says, the earth has yielded its, its increase. Contextually, uh, this, this idea may be, be present in the psalm because the psalm was written in the harvest season. So the abundance of, of the harvest, it would have lifted the thoughts of the psalmist to the greatest harvest that is yet to come. Now, here's what I take from that. Whenever I see this imagery of the psalmist talking about the harvest and how God has yielded its increase, the earth has yielded its increase, here's what I take from that. You should use what you see around you as a reason to praise God. Use what you see around you. The psalmist saw a field that was ready for harvest, and he said, that reminds me of a reason to praise God. Maybe you see a sunrise or a sunset. Maybe you're on the beach or in the mountains. Maybe it's uh, the birth of a new baby. Maybe it's the task that you go throughout in everyday life. All that you see should result in thoughts about God and praise to his name. Verse 7, part B says, God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. John Owen said this. He said, God gets the respect, the honor, the praise, the glory he is worthy of. God gets it. He will get it. We may never get respected. We may never face anything but hardship. We may end up poor and broken and persecuted and even laying down our lives and be more blessed than ever because God has used us in a great way. How powerful is that? You could lose your life, your possessions, your notoriety, your stature, all these things and be as blessed as ever simply based on the fact that God chose to use you. May we know his way which leads to a logical question. Do you know his way? As I finished this morning, it's a very appropriate question. Do you know his way? It's really hard to make a way known that you don't know. That's when we start saying, well, you go around the corner and there's a tree over there and then you take a left and there's a stump and a rock and you might see a bird fly by. No, I need you to tell me, go down two miles and take a left on this street, then go if you're telling me those instructions, then I know you know the way. You're not guessing at the way. You know the way. And the beautiful thing about the God that we serve is he has made his way known. He didn't say, hey, you got to play hide and seek, try to figure it out. Good luck. Hope you find it. No. He has made his way known. Spurgeon said this. He said, we never love God a right till we know him to be ours. And the more we love him, the more we, the more do we long to be fully assured that he is ours. You know, I think about just even in a natural relationship. That's with your spouse. I think about me and Ashley's relationship. I think about the times that we get to spend together. And there's, there's many times where she'll be like, do you love me? And it's not a question of her wondering, do I love her? She just likes the reassurance of it. And I'll do the same thing to her. Just to continually hear that yes. It just makes you feel good. And it's okay for you to approach the Father and just be reminded that he loves you because he chose to continually remind you. Continually remind you in every way that he does love you. The reassurance that I am his and he is mine. 
It keeps you. It keeps you. Because this world offers superficial love that will make you convinced that it loves you, but be convinced that it loves you, but it doesn't love you. The world does not care for you at all. And the things of this world. True love doesn't simply take, it gives. For God so loved the world that he gave. And that is a continual reminder that we have that we are his and he is ours. So God chose to allow us to approach him and ask for this type of blessing. And God in his gracious way and his gracious nature has pronounced a blessing upon us. This is why Aaron as the high priest pronounces this on the people of God. This is why we see this in the psalm. We see benedictions that Paul would write at the end of his letters saying, go and be blessed. May the God of all grace, may he keep you. The blessing. Now here's how I want to relate this into what's going on today, in particular with Father's Day. Days like today can be really, really difficult for a lot of people. For some of you in coming here today, your hope probably was that I wasn't going to mention much about Father's Day because you don't have great memories when it comes to fathers. Maybe you had a dad but didn't have a father. There was someone who was supposed to be there and was not there. Maybe there's someone who loved you deeply and has gone on to be with the Lord. Maybe you never even knew him. You never even knew your father. Days like today are, they're tough. Maybe even on days like today when we say things like God is a good father and all you've experienced is really, really hard calamity and tragedy and you go, God, I'm struggling with that good part. Because if you're such a good father, then why have I gone through what I've gone through? Why has the struggle been so hard? Every time I'm reminded of that situation, that tragedy, that moment, I struggle with the goodness of God. But God is the good father that he is. He chooses to remain patient with us. He chooses to hear our cry, hear our, our frustrations. But he doesn't turn his back on you. He doesn't go, oh, you're questioning me, so who do you think you are? No, God... God is patient, God is loving, God is kind. And a part of the way that we declare God's way to be known is that even through the difficulties of life, God has proven to be faithful. I might have a hard time seeing that because all I'm looking at is what I'm looking at. But God has chosen to pronounce this blessing upon us. And he said, I'm going to be gracious towards you. I'm going to make my face shine upon you, even in your moments of the deepest struggle. And so dads, those of you that are, those of you that hope to be, I think there's a lesson to be learned in this. I think it's important to understand that there's a blessing that God has bestowed upon us. And even if you didn't have a good example, if he was never around, you've got the epitome of fatherhood in Jesus. But if you do have children, you too should also pronounce a blessing upon your children. Have you thought about the nature of your grace and mercy towards your kids? Have you thought about your countenance upon your children? Have you thought about the importance of reassuring them of the fact that you're there and you love them? That's the stuff we're asking of God in the text in Psalm 67. Let that be lived out in your homes amongst your children. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up. Don't stop. Sometimes men do feel un, underappreciated because you do a lot. You are the stability within the home. But I want you to keep living up to that. If you never hear any affirmation from anybody else, hear it from me this morning. You are needed. You are loved. You're important. Keep on keeping on. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give in. There's too much riding on this. Be a man of God in the midst of a culture that wants to dilute you. Be a man of God with a backbone. Stand flat-footed on the word of God. 
Raise your kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing, how they're raising their kids, what they do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Stand on that. And maybe you're not father. Maybe you're father figure. You're, you're an uncle. you got influence over the lives of others. It's just as important. Stand on that. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask. Dads, if you all would stand, I just, I want to pray over you this morning. And, you know, sometimes I struggle with things like this. I'm just being honest with you. Because I don't want to throw any shade on anybody that's not a dad or, you know. But I don't want to not do it just because there are some who aren't. These men that are standing, they, they need encouragement. They need to be reaffirmed of who they are in Christ. And so those of us that are sitting, let's pray for these men. Let's support these men. Gracious God, I come before you this morning, Father, thanking you that there are men in the church who love you, who are leading well. God, but I've heard it described this way in a song that inside of every warrior is a child. And those of us who try to stand strong, who endure so much in defense as the front line of our families, Lord, sometimes it gets tiring, it gets, you get weary, you get worn down. So Lord, I just pray that these men first and foremost will be reminded of who they are in you, God, that they would run and direct themselves to you, that they would know that they are called unto you, God. We're not first called to be fathers, we're not first called to be daddies. We're not first called to be husbands. We're first called to be children of you, the living God. So Lord, may we submit ourselves to your authority, which will help us lead those well around us. God, that we we might affirm the scriptures, God, that tell us that we, our submission is to you first. God, help us to live lives of integrity, lives that are above reproach, As examples to those that are watching us, Father, give us the strength for the journey. Protect these men in their hearts, their minds, God, their eyes, their ears. What they say, God, to be examples to the watching world. Lord, thank you for days like today that just continue to remind us that ultimately we do have a good Father in you. And maybe what we didn't have, you can still allow us to become. So, Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for these men. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask that everyone stand as we sing this final song of worship. Um, And as you depart, like, let Psalms 67 rest on you. Go back to that psalm this week. Find encouragement in that psalm. Go back, listen to the message again. Let it just be a regurgitation for you, a meditation in the Word. And it's going to help you this week. It's going to bless you this week as we reflect on the fact that God has bestowed blessing on us, his countenance, it shines upon you, and you can leave here with great joy knowing that your God loves you, and he's made a way for you to come to him and made a way for him to be known. Let's sing.